From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Martin Scottman, Mr. Dollar, at Eastern Liability and Trust. Oh, yes, sir. Got your message. I was just about to call you back, Mr. Scottman. Would it be possible for you to drop in and see me today? I think so. Say in an hour. That would be excellent. What's it about, Mr. Scottman? David Perling. Perling? I understand he was killed in a boating accident a couple of days ago. Read something about it in the papers. To borrow a phrase, Mr. Dollar, that report was somewhat exaggerated. Mr. Perling is still very much alive. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. Mr. Scantman, you're a pretty good guy, and I'll say this right at the top, since you were the one who called me in. You're reading about the Perling matter in your newspaper right now, but they haven't got the story right. None of them will ever have it quite right. Just remember that as you go through your newspaper in this report, Mr. Scantman. You looked pretty worried when I met you that afternoon about 5 o'clock and you led me into the top drawer offices of Eastern Liability and Trust. I tagged you as a meticulous sort of man who knew when his laundry was coming back. I wasn't a bit surprised to learn that you were vice president and chairman of the board. Why don't you sit down there, Mr. Dollar? It's the best chair in the place. Thanks. Cigar? Cigarette? No, I have these. Thanks. Lighter right there to your right. Thanks. Yes, Mrs. Garman. You can run along for tonight, Evelyn. No more to do. Thank you, sir. Good night. Good night, Evelyn. I, uh, understand you've handled several matters for our company, Mr. Dollar. Yes, sir. I was just going over it in my mind. Uh, I believe the last one was the San Antonio case. Yes. Mark San Antonio. Yes, yes. You handled that very well, Mr. Dollar. I want you to know I appreciate your reputation in the field. Nice of you to mention it. I'm curious, Mr. Scottman. I rarely work directly with an insurance company. Usually I'm hired by the adjusting agency. And let's say this is a little idea on my own. Only one person knows about it so far. You will be the second. Board of directors might not exactly prove what I'm about to propose. But I feel some action should be taken. I have uh, some good whiskey in that cabinet. If no, you thanks. Not now. Yes. Well, this case involves David Perling, who, despite what the newspapers reported yesterday, is still very much alive. You say you saw the item in the papers? Yes, something about uh, him being killed in a boating accident in Florida, I think. The story was erroneous. It'll be retracted. Oh? The fact of the matter is, Mr. Perling was already on his way back to New York, safe and sound when that report came out. The boat that he'd been fishing from did have a boiler explosion, but no one was killed. Well, these things sometimes happen, I guess. Oh, sure they do. However, it was printed all over the country. As you know, David Perling is highly regarded in financial circles. And that is the reason I asked you to come in and talk to me. Did you uh, see the stock exchange figures yesterday? Well, uh, I don't pay too much attention to them, Mr. Scott. I do. Uh, we do, as an insurance company. That report of Perling's death affected several commodities listed on the New York exchange. Companies in which he holds varying positions. Positions that would, uh, if, say, the report of his death were engineered for that specific purpose allow certain people to risk very little money and make a great deal of money. Uh, just a minute, sir. Certain people? Are you talking about Perling? I don't know who I'm talking about, really. I'd like you to find that out. Find out, among other things, if the situation has been taken advantage of in any way. Mm, this isn't exactly in my line, Mr. Scottman. I think it is, Mr. Dollar. I'll come right out with it. Eastern liability has considerable investment in some of the commodities that could be affected. We, or let's put it this way... I want to know where we stand. I want to know if we've been cheated or are about to be cheated. I had dinner with Morton Scottman at his club. He acquainted me with the several companies involved in the matter and supplied me with stock exchange information that would be valuable in making comparisons in case the action he anticipated ever happened. An hour later, I was at the airport. Expense account item one, $123.69. Airfare and incidentals from Hartford to Key West, Florida. I arrived at 4 o'clock in the morning, found a hotel, and had six hours sleep. 
At 11.30, I was standing in the office of a bluff, red-faced man named Peyton. He happened to be the managing editor of a newspaper. Yeah, all the, uh, all the way from Hartford, Connecticut, eh? Well, welcome to Key West. What can I do for you? Tell me about this story. Ah, a Perlin story, huh? Yeah. You a lawyer? No. You here to make trouble? Just find out something about how that story got into print, that's all. We're retracting today. What do you want us to do? Wear sackcloth and ashes? <laughs> well, I'm not here to file a suit. I just want some information about the story. You can sit down if you want to. Well, thanks. Just... Find Gracie Edwards, will you? Right. Well, about like the newspaper story, except for the mistake. That was a pretty good-sized mistake, Mr. Payton. Berlin was here for a week to ten days. He had an idea he could catch some tarpon or sailfish. He chartered a boat called the Yacht Watcher the day before yesterday. Just heading in for the landing, somehow the fuel ignited and she blew up. Everybody thought Perlin was still aboard her. Who was aboard her? Mr. Skibber. He came out of it all right. Harbor patrol boat picked him up. Mm-hmm. Go on. Everybody thought Perlin had been aboard as usual and was lost. The skipper wasn't in any shape to tell it differently then. After all, Perlin had been going out on her every day. We all knew that. Where was Perlin? He was sleeping in his room when all of this happened. Got up about 3 o'clock, checked out, took the train back to New York. Story came out in the evening edition. Your reporter, the one who wrote it up, I'd like to see him. It's a her. Well, how did she get the story? It was right there. Right where? What do you mean? Down at the sailfish landing when the yacht watcher come in. That a regular beat? Well, town this size, we don't have beats. But your reporter was there when the boat caught fire. Yeah. Uh, what's her name? Gracie Edwards. How long has she been a reporter? A couple of years, give or take a month. Hope you didn't come down here to run her over the cold. Oh, she's had enough of it, Dollar. For me, it's my job, not yours. Okay, okay. Where do you eat lunch around here? Bluefin Bar and Grill, about a half block down this side of the street. Dip beef and apple pie, if you like that kind of thing. <laughs> Oh, hi, Gracie. Yeah, this is Johnny Dollar, Gracie Edwards. Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Mr. Dollar's come all the way from Hartford to ask you some question about the Perlin story, Gracie. You want to talk to him? Do I have to? Up to you, honey. Who are you? What do you want to know? I'm an insurance investigator. I want to know how the story got into print without being verified. Well, that's a straight enough answer. Um, who do you investigate your insurance for? Eastern Liability and Trust Company at the moment. Yeah, he's got business cards and everything. Yeah, he looks like he might do that kind of work. Well, if you're going to talk to him, find someplace else. I've got work to do. How about some lunch, Miss Edwards? How about that? Oh, get out. Expense account item two, two dollars, two lunches for Gracie Edwards and myself at the Bluefin Bar and Grill. She was a short, stocky woman in her early 30s. She had a fresh-looking face and fiery red hair. She didn't strike me as the kind of reporter who'd make a bad mistake. I did it the way any cub would have, only worse. I had a 3 o'clock deadline. I wanted to make it. I could have waited till the skipper came to, said Perling wasn't aboard. I could have contacted Perling's hotel, found out he was safely there. I didn't do any of that. I just phoned in my story. You know the rest. Every wire service in the country picked it up. Guess I was lucky I wasn't fired. Mm -hmm. You want another glass of beer? Mm, no, no thanks. You've been pretty nice. I'm sure you're not all insurance investigator. Notice I haven't asked you exactly what you're investigating. Yeah, I noticed that. You gonna tell me? Possibly. Right now, something worries me. Uh, you were down at the landing when the boat caught fire? Yeah. You go down there often? It's more or less my beat. Oh? What? I didn't think a reporter would have a beat in a town this size. I said more or less. I like to go down there in mid-afternoon when the boats are coming back. The water's blue and fresh. Usually a good offshore breeze blowing. Now, if they caught any big fish, the flags are up. It's a place to go. I'm romantic. Good. Suppose we go there. Hmm? 2.30 now. Ought to see some of those boats come in. Expense account item three, one buck, one cab, transporting myself and Gracie Edwards' reporter to Sailfish Landing, or as near as we could get. The last 500 yards, we had to walk on the planking between the slips. Now, uh, tell me, where was the yacht watcher when she blew up? Uh, over there. About there. Uh-huh. Where were you? Right here. 
I was sitting right there. Looking out to sea? Uh Uh-huh. How long had you been here? Oh, an hour or so. That was day before yesterday? Yes. She blew up there. You phoned in your story before 3 o'clock? Yeah, right before 3. Where's the yacht watcher now? They raised her this morning, towed her over the repair docks. That's around the point. That's kind of funny. What's funny? Well, I, I guess I didn't hear it right. You, you saw her get in trouble. You were right here. Then you went and phoned in your story. That's right. Well, where'd you phone it in? What? Last phone I saw was at the tavern before we came on the docks. High heels running over these slips. Take quite a while to get to it. I used a phone in town. How'd you get there? Cab. You had one waiting? Look, suppose I did. Suppose you didn't, Miss Edwards. Suppose you weren't even here. If you were, where's the sunburn? Every redhead on earth burns up in an hour when the sun's like this, unless you're an exception. I don't think I like this. I don't like it much myself. But I have to find out something. I'd like to find out from you. I hope I can. If I can't, I'll have to find out from someone else. Maybe the man who owned the boat, the man who ran it, someone around here. I'm going. Wait a minute. I'm not just throwing words around. The boat was probably insured, and it'll probably have a claim on it, and I'll probably know the adjuster who was sent to work the claim. I'll talk to him and tell him what I'm thinking. I'll find out about this one way or another, Miss Edwards, but I think you can help me. Now, you're a good reporter. You would have waited to see if Perling was aboard. You would have checked his hotel. You would have, in spite of a three o'clock deadline, you would have made sure he was or wasn't aboard that boat. All right, Miss Edwards. Did somebody pay you to file that story? I just want to know that. Somebody paid me. Yes. (sighs) Okay. I'll take you back now. We don't have to mention this again. Yeah, okay. In case it comes up, though... Yeah? Mr. Perling paid me. Paid me to print the story he was dead. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow... The affairs of Wall Street follow the current trend in cheating and mayhem. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dog. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for another exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Ready with your call to Hartford. Uh, hello? Hello, Mr. Scottman, Johnny Dollar. Hope I didn't get you up. Uh, No, no, no. I've been very anxious to hear from you. Well, I thought I'd better call, Mr. Scottman. I just found out that David Perling paid a reporter here in Key West to print that story about his death. I 
see. I can be in New York at 7 tomorrow morning. Could you meet me there sometime? I can meet you at Idlewild. My plane comes in at 7.20. From Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. Expense account continued. Item three, $98.09. Airfare and incidentals, including board and room, Key West to New York City. Mort Scottman was in the airport coffee shop having tea and toast in the best tradition of a vice president. He looks shaved, rested, and fresh. Would you uh, like some breakfast, Mr. Dollar? Mm, just coffee for now, thanks. A cup of coffee, please. Well, we seem to have made nice connections. Not uh, 7.30 yet. Yeah. Mr. Scottman, the reporter in Key West who printed that story about David Perling was paid $100 in cash to do it. Perling paid her to file an erroneous story that he had been killed in a boating accident. You said uh, cash? Yeah, that's right, cash. No check. No way to prove it one way or another. Just the reporter's word. And she said she'd deny it if anybody else asked her. Disclaim the whole thing. Well, where does that put us? Well, look, Perling had to pay somebody to fire that boat. Probably the skipper, I don't know. But it's an angle if you're thinking about legal lines. It's very good. Of course, the boat would demand explanation. Well, let's let it go for the moment. I noticed a retraction disclaiming the story of Perling's death is in every paper this morning. It was in all of last night's papers, too. Now, if the story could affect the stock market, when would it show up? Today, at the latest. There was no action yesterday? Not on the exchange, no. How do you feel about this whole thing now? In view of the fact you've ascertained that Perling himself arranged for his own death report to be published, I can only assume that he did it for one reason. To take advantage of some brisk trading that would occur because of such a report. But there's been nothing of that so far. Hmm. Uh, tell me, Mr. Scotman, in the event this does happen, what would you do? Well, I, I don't know exactly. Possibly report the matter to the exchange and see if Perling could be prosecuted for manipulation. Well, let's go over there and see what's what. <laughs> Item four, five dollars. Cab fare for myself and Morton Scottman to Wall Street and the New York Stock Exchange. Since I didn't understand too much about the board, I simply sat and kept an eye on Scottman. The pinstripe suit, the Hamburg, the tie, the shirt, the glasses. <laughs> Somehow he tickled me. I was beginning to like the guy. About 15 minutes before the place closed, he cleared his throat and touched my arm. I, uh, suspicioned wrong, Mr. Dollar. There's been no manipulation on the exchange. I thought certainly if there had been any, it would appear in that Alabama company. <laughs> I was wrong, and I apologize for taking up your time. You're paying for it. Besides, I'm glad you did. Mm hmm Shall we go? Yeah. Where? Well, we know he didn't have the story printed to cheat on the market, but we still have the same old question. What's that? Why did Perling pay that reporter to say he was dead? The reporter lied to you. You've uh, been lied to before, I'm sure. Oh, sure. And by experts. But she wasn't a good one. Not even halfway good. So I still believe her story. You believe that board up there? I believe that, too. Well, then? Perling had a reason for getting such a story printed. I want to find out about it. <laughs> Expense account item five, four dollars. Lunch for Morton Scottman and myself. After lunch, I checked into the new Weston. Item six, fifty dollars deposit, car rental. A phone call to the offices of David Perling gave me the information that Mr. Perling was at his home on Long Island. I drove out there. A small estate greened up with all the lush things that happened there this time of the year. As I reached the place, I noticed a group of people in white flannels and dark blue jackets mixing cocktails on the terrace. One of them I recognized from previous newspaper pictures as David Perling. A middle-aged woman with iron-gray hair and the figure of a 16-year-old girl opened the door. She looked from behind dark glasses disapprovingly. Yes? How do you do? I'd like to see Mr. Perling, if I may. I'm Mrs. Perling. May I help you? Well, this is a business matter, Mrs. Perling. My name's Dollar, Eastern Liability and Trust Company. Well, he's not in now. I suggest you call his office and explain the nature of your business to his secretary. Good day, Mr. Dollar. Look, I know he's here. I saw him as I drove up. You are both impertinent and rude. I'm sure he'll see me if you give him my name and tell him I just came back from Key West and that I had a long talk with a newspaper reporter down there. Since you saw so much as you drove up, you might have noticed that we're entertaining guests, Mr. Dollar. Oh, I noticed that. Wait here. I stood there a moment on the wide colonial porch and wondered what made me such a social outcast. 
A man who was tending the grounds walked by and turned on the sprinkling system. He waved at me, and I waved back. I felt better. On the terrace, I could hear the tinkle of glasses and a little laughter now and then. Finally, David Perling showed up. He was a tall man with a hairline that started about an inch above the heaviest eyebrows I've ever seen. Two-toned shoes, white flannels, and a Mexican sports shirt fitted in with a broad shoulders and wide mouth grin that came off just briefly when he looked at me. My wife told me to throw you out. Can you think of any reason why I shouldn't? I'm about ten pounds lighter than you, but I might be a good fifteen years younger. Tell me what you want, kiddo, and then get out of here. I want you to tell me why you paid Gracie Edwards a hundred dollars to print a story about you being dead. Who are you, anyway? Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. What's all this to you? An investigation. There's no way you can prove I paid that girl to print that story. I know that. I was telling a friend of mine today that something probably could be proved about the boat, if it had to be. Then the reporter thing had come out. I don't know. You see, Eastern Liability had an idea that you might have had that story printed to cause a little action on the stock market. Who at Eastern Liability? I'll keep that to myself. Well, it doesn't make any difference anyhow. They're way off base. Or can't you figure that part? Mm, That's why I'm here. I figured that part. Suppose I told you I don't know what you're talking about. I'd ask you all over again. Tell you about a reporter and a boat. Dollar, you've gone this far, and it's probably as far as you're going. I'm not going to tell you anything. At least anything specific. I will tell you this much. I paid the reporter in cash. I paid the boatman the same way. Whatever reason I had, it was a good one. Meant to harm no one. You're sure about that, Mr. Perling? As sure as I'm going inside right now and mix another batch of martinis. For the second time in a matter of minutes, I was standing on a porch feeling like Typhoid Mary. Somehow I halfway believed David Perling. I also halfway believed that whatever reason he had meant something to me. All halfway thinking. If you want to be left alone, you don't slam a door once or even twice. You invite the asker of the question in, give him a drink, introduce him to your friend, slap him on the back, and lie through your teeth. You don't tell a man to leave, because that's the best way in the world to make him keep coming. So I waved at the friendly gardener once more, climbed into my rented car, drove back to the new Weston, and sat down with a magazine. Johnny Dollar. This is Celia Perling, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Perling. I think I should like to talk to you, Mr. Dollar. David told me why you were at the house. Mm Mm-hmm. I'm downstairs in the lobby. I'll be right down, Mrs. Perling. I had to drive some friends in tonight, and I thought I'd stop and have this chat with you. I'm glad you did. Somewhat embarrassing. I mean, after the way I acted at the house. Oh, well, suppose we forget that part, Mrs. Perling. Does Mr. Perling know that you're here? No, I'll tell him when I get home. There's something I must know. What's that? You aren't just a sensation seeker or something like that, are you? Mrs. Perling, let me answer you this way. You came to me. How you found me, I don't know, but you did. You also found out I'm a legitimate investigator interested in facts, am I right? David called a friend of his with the Allied Bureau, and they told him you were an insurance investigator. Uh Uh-huh, and they also told you that when I work a case in New York, I generally stay at the New Weston. Is that about it? I'd like to ask you a question. Are you going to continue with this matter, the one you discussed with my husband this afternoon? I suppose I am. You mean you... you believe there was something ulterior in David having that story printed? Well, let's say I believe his answers about it were unsatisfactory. I'm the fellow who's supposed to find out why. Why? It's my job. I can assure you there wasn't anything wrong about it at all. It was a rather personal matter and certainly could harm no one. I'm glad to hear that. I heard it once before, though. Your husband said it to me today in practically the same words. Would you like to buy me a drink? Sure. Come on. We walked through the lobby to the cocktail lounge without a word. We sat down without a word, and I ordered a couple of bourbons and water. Still no word. All around us, people poured drinks, laughed, and talked. I glanced at Mrs. Perling from time to time and wore the blankest expression I knew how. Finally, it worked. She began in a small voice. We have a daughter, Mr. Dollar. Her name's Eugenia. Jeannie, we call her. Mm Mm-hmm. She's the reason for that story in the papers. Tell me about it. It's not easy, you know. It's... I mean, it's, it's admitting a prominent defeat to explain it. We're... David and myself are considered quite capable people. Capable at most everything. Business, home. Capable of everything except raising a child into a woman. 
I'd rather not go into the faults that we have, Mr. Dollar. No need to. Are they that obvious? Oh, I didn't mean that. I just mean it seems painful for you to even discuss this. I'll say it this way. We've had too much money and too little time to put it on... on Jeannie. Now we're suffering for it. How do you mean? Jeannie got sick and tired of being alone and unattended and not understood. She left home a year ago and we haven't seen her or heard from her since. She left a note saying that we never would. I suppose we deserve it. Well, I wouldn't try to judge that. We have no idea where she is, what she's doing, even if she's with someone. We just know she's gone. It's really quite ridiculous. Now that Jeannie's gone, we know how much we wanted her around. What about the police? Well, we... we didn't go to the police. I think you can understand why. I mean the publicity. Who did you go to? The Aimwell Agency. They've been working on it. Oh, yeah, I've heard of them. Any luck? Not a sign of her. Do you understand now? Well, I don't understand everything. I'm sorry she's missing. But about the story in the paper... Well, Davy arranged that. I mean that his death would be reported. It was a crazy thing to do, I suppose. But we've tried everything else. He thought that if he were reported dead, Jeannie, wherever she was was, would see the story and possibly contact me. You see, it's... it's unbearable knowing she's alive somewhere, hating us this way. We wanted another chance. No luck? No luck. Not a word. Not a word. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the trap is all baited. And guess who walks in? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Your number's ringing now, Mr. Dollar. Oh, swell. Aimwell Agency. Aimwell Detectives? Yes. Who are you calling, please? Want to talk to Mr. Aimwell. My name's Johnny Dollar. This is Aimwell. I understand your agency's been looking for the Perling girl for about a year now. Oh, you do, huh? And who told you that? Mrs. Perling. I never heard of you or her or a girl. So long. <laughs> this is the operator. Were you cut off, Mr. Dollar? I'll call them back. Never mind. Call me a cab, honey. I'll talk to them in person. <laughs> Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. Item seven, three dollars, cab fare, my hotel to the office of the Aimwell Agency. A red-headed girl at the switchboard looked me over like I was a car she didn't want to buy. I told her my name and that I wanted to see Niles Aimwell. She told me to sit down and wait. Three minutes later, she waved me down a long carpeted corridor. I followed directions. A typewriter clacked somewhere. Men in those suits with the little shoulders and hem stitching for lapels moved in and out of offices. It looked more like an advertising office than a detective agency. Finally, I opened a door and stepped into a small room that was decorated in gray. Gray walls, gray carpeting, gray draperies. A desk, a brass lamp, a filing cabinet, and a man were there. He didn't get up when I walked in, but slouched back in his chair and let his bald head rest against the wall. You're kind of determined, aren't you? I suppose so. Your aim well? Mm-hmm. On the phone, I told you I didn't know what you were talking about. Now I'll tell you again. Don't slam the door when you go out. What are you paying rent here? <laughs> if I've got it figured right, you wish you weren't paying it. But then a place like this draws a snappier crowd of clients, so uh, what you've got in the end is more clients and more rent. No more money for yourself. Now that you've said all that, will you get out of here? I know one of those snappy clients happens to be the Perlings. I know you've been trying to find their daughter. This is my ID. This is my license. Bond. Letter of authority from Eastern Liability. Now, two days ago, the papers carried a story that David Perling was killed in a boating accident in Key West. That was a lot of baloney. 
It was retracted. I know that, but I talked to a reporter down in Key West who told me Perling paid to have that story about himself printed. My client had an idea Perling might have done it to set up the stock market for a killing. Mrs. Perling told me he did it in the hope his missing daughter would see the story in the papers and contact home. Now, what have you got to say? Here's your stuff. One other thing. Perling the kind of man who'd pull a trick like that? Ask him. You got a way about you I don't like. Well, that's too bad. But in between the time I called and the time I got here, you had time to call the Perlings on the phone and ask about me. They said it was all right to tell me what I wanted to know. If there was a daughter, if you'd been hired to look for her, if you don't tell me, you might jeopardize the part of the rent the Perlings pay for you. Now, look, Dollar... I've got something else you aren't going to like. I might just want to see your operatives report on the case. I might have the idea that if you've been looking for her this long, you might just be dragging it out a little bit. You know, the rent money, it's due every month... Get Mr. or Mrs. Perling on the phone right away. I hope they tell me to throw you out on your ear. (laughs) Well, while we're waiting, let's get back to the questions. Where have you looked? What have you done? We pulled a case 11 months ago, almost to the day. The girl's 5'5", 114 pounds, no visible scars, no glasses. Black hair, brown eyes. She's 24, will be 25 next month. We thought we had her located in Muncie, Toledo, Detroit, Fort Worth, and Pueblo. We think she's traveling alone. We think she's a little girl who was fed up to here with Mama and Daddy and just struck out for herself. But you haven't found her. Five men have been looking on eight-hour shifts, seven days a week for 11 months to the day. Five men, 11 months, seven days a week, and I'm one of the five. My feet hurt, my head aches most of the time. My wife's thinking about divorcing me. And then you walk in here and plant yourself in my office. You're suggesting maybe I can go out and find her just like that. Well, I can't. Nobody can. So I want you to know I kind of resent that remark about how I'm laying down on the job. And if you don't take it back, I'll have to cave in the side of the wall with you. What do you got to say, (laughs) Dalton? I take it back, Mr. Ringwell. Sit down and have yourself a smoke. Hello. Well, hello, Mrs. Perling. Mr. Dollar's in my office now. Yes, yes, I'll cooperate with him. Yes, Mrs. Perling, I understand. He explained it all to me. Yes, ma'am. <sighs> the whole file, everything. How would you like somebody to bring up a bottle of cold beer? Oh, I'd like that fine, Mr. Amwell. Niles Amwell, in between complaining about the abundance of bad private operatives in the detective business, showed me how good he was. The Jeannie Perling file was a comprehensive day-to-day report on the investigation. His discouragement in the case was understandable. The only thing that meant something was the picture of Jeannie Perling. Cold black hair over a fresh white-skinned face. Dark eyes, a nice smile. Somehow, not my idea of the daughter that would belong to David Perling. Too old, too young, or too something. I couldn't put my finger on it. If I had been able to, I could have ended this expense account right here. As it was, I spent $100,000. Somebody else's money, sure. But I spent it just the same. Well, Mr. Dollar, I'm certainly surprised at this development. You say Perling's daughter is missing? That's right, Mr. Scottman. And I'm convinced that the detective agency he's had looking for her have been doing just that. Eh, well, then, I'm relieved to know you got to the bottom of this matter. I'm sorry, of course, for Mr. and Mrs. Perling. But, as I say, relieved that there, there was no attempt at financial manipulation. I think then I can call you off the case. There is no case now. Nope. Guess not. <laughs> And that's the way it stood at four o'clock in the afternoon. I told Mr. Scottman I'd send him a bill. We shook hands, and he wandered off to see if he could get a night flight back to Hartford. I went up to my room to pack and was folding a shirt all wrong when it struck me that I suddenly didn't believe anything or anybody. The idea that there was money in it somewhere still kept coming back to me. I couldn't shake it. I finished packing and left my bags at the desk. I wandered out and found a bar and sat down to think. After a couple of hours, nothing much occurred to me. But I did something anyhow. Hello, Dollar. Hi. 
My uh, plane doesn't leave till 11 o'clock. I haven't had dinner yet. I, hope I you... didn't come about dinner, Mr. Scudman. Well, what is it? Well, how does this case strike you? Eh? A phony death report, a missing girl, a stock market manipulation that didn't come off. How does it strike you? Well, very neat, if that's a phrase I can use, Mr. Dollar. We had a question with serious implications to it. We have an answer now. That's what we wanted. But it's too neat. I'm not sure I know quite what you mean. Look, you first called me in because it was halfway in your mind that Perling's alleged death was for the purpose of making money on the market. Now, why did you think that? It was a possibility. But what else? What about Perling? What do you mean? Do you know him? Ever met him? Do you think he was capable of a thing like that? Not now. No. I have proof from you that that wasn't his reason at all. But you thought so before you had that proof. You suspected it. I suppose I did, yes. Well, I didn't know him from a load of coal, but I always figured there's money in it somewhere. And I've met David Perling. He doesn't seem like the kind of man who'd worry about a grown daughter who didn't like him and ran away. Just, just didn't seem that way. Oh, here now. A detective agency working on the case, a story in the paper. But no police, Mr. Scottman. No bulletins. No 100% effort to find her. Why? I suppose you have a good point. I'm sure I have a good point, Mr. Scottman. Money's always a good point. But what money, how, why, I don't know. I can't answer those questions. I wish I could. If I could, I'd know that a man like Dave Perling was lying through his teeth if he told me he wanted his daughter back safe at home. I'd know why he was lying. I know I'm just talking and getting nowhere right now, but... Well, I thought, I thought I'd better tell you what was on my mind. Yes, well, you've certainly done that. Now what? That's up to you. Oh. Well, if you feel so strongly about this, I think then you should continue. I thought it was ended, but in view of the circumstances, continue. By all means, continue. Well, Dollar? Well, you're working late. Yeah, I'd rather stay here than go home sometimes. Most of the time. Hey, well, we might be seeing quite a bit of each other. How did you know? Hmm? Perling told me to contact you. You're pretty cute, Dollar. Tell me why. You hardly ever run across a picture of a girl you'd like to look at as much as this Perling dame. Oh, I might have. You know, you kid me most of the time, and I'm an old slob who stands around with hardly any fast answers. But you aren't kidding me this time, Pally. You show it all over. If I walked in a place and I seen a girl as nice looking as this, and I had any business with her, I'd be the luckiest guy in the world. You know, there are women, and there are women. But if that picture means anything... Boy, she's a woman. And you want to meet her, right? Sure, I want to meet her, but you're getting romantic. And if I saw, but didn't have any business with her, just saw, I'd go take a walk around the block before I talked to anybody. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I don't blame you. You're a very lucky fella. You're going to see her. That's why Perling asked me to contact you. Huh? Here. Came in about an hour ago. One of our men located her. Where? She's in New Orleans. He handed me the wire and I read it over. Then I looked at him, he looked at me. I didn't ask any questions, he didn't say a word. It was a wonderful make-believe world, but it really didn't exist. Too neat and too tidy. And we all know the world's full of bumps. Ever hear of Mount Everest? <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, once you get in on a joke, you do what they tell you. You go along with a gag. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dave Perling, Mr. Dollar. I want to talk to you. Hello, Mr. Perling. Mr. Amwell tells me you're in his office looking into my private affairs. If investigating the matter I came here for involves your private affairs, I guess I did that. I should be irritated, I suppose. And I guess I'm not. When can I see you? Most any time. How about today? I'll be at my house all day long. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. Item 9, 10 cents, one phone call to Morton Scottman, advising him that Jeannie Perling had been located in New Orleans by one of Aimwell's operatives. Mr. Scottman thought that over for a while and then assumed it would be in the best interests of Eastern liability to make certain this was the truth. I told Mr. Scottman I intended to do just that. Item 10, $5, cab fare from the New Western Hotel to the home of David Perling. Hi. Come on in. The man who opened the door wasn't a servant. He wore a dark blue double-breasted suit. He smelled of cigars and bourbon and private detectives stuck out all over him. He jammed a pudgy finger in the general direction of what later turned out to be the library, and I followed. The room we went into was empty, except for us. As far as I could see or hear, the rest of the house was empty, too. The man in the blue suit sat down on a leather sofa and pointed to a quart of bourbon that had just come out of a sack. You must be this dollar guy, huh? Yeah. Mr. Perling will be along in a minute. He asked me to say hello to you. Uh, by the way, my name's Brad Copeland. I'm one of Niles' men. Niles, ain't well? That's great. Where is Niles? Uh, he's with Mr. Perling. they will be along. Sit down, relax. They said they thought it was about time for a little conference. What for? The girl's been found, hasn't she? Oh, sure, sure. Now they got to figure some other things out. I'll bet. You don't believe much of this, do you? Nope. Well, then I'll put it this way. I'm the guy who found Jeannie Perling. How about it now? Okay. Look, I got put on this thing because an insurance company executive thought Perling might have had a false death report made on him to juggle some things in the stock market. Ah, oh, that story in the papers about Perling dying, huh? Yeah, Perling paid to have that story printed, all right. But not for any stock market angles. He did it to try and scare up this daughter of his who scrammed away from home a year ago. Now, I found that hard to believe. Even after I talked to Niles Aimwell and he told me the agency had been hired to find the girl a year ago. I suppose you're one of the men who's been looking. Yeah, that's about it. No luck either. And yesterday morning comes a phone call. I don't know who it is. Tells me where she's living, what name she's using in New Orleans. I scram down there by plane and check it out. It's all true. So I come back here and here I am. Conference. You found her on a tip from somebody you don't know? Man or woman? Always a man's voice. Wonderful, ain't it, what happens sometimes? How does it look to you? Like a sealed freight car full of nothing. That's the girl down there in you owe, all right. I manage that. I picked up her prints and checked them with what we had to go on. But what's what, I don't know. What's Amo going to do now? That's why the conference. We see what we'll see. Relax. I tried to do that, but I didn't do very well. Copeland settled to his bourbon, and I picked up and laid down a half a dozen magazines, smoked two cigarettes, paced up and down. Finally, I heard a door open somewhere, and Niles Aimwell and David Perling walked in the room. Then Aimwell motioned Copeland to his feet, and both of them left the room without a word. David Perling and I were alone. How much do they pay you, Dollar? Oh, I'm paid well enough. What's that got to do with it? I was just curious, is all. You seem like a competent man. As a matter of fact, the most competent I've met, and that includes Mr. Aimwell and Mr. Copeland. By the way, I, I just fired them. Really? I don't think I need them anymore now that I know where Jeannie is. Oh? You've had an extraordinary interest in my affairs lately. I'm willing to bet that you won't leave me alone until you're satisfied about my daughter. You'd be right. I want Jeannie to come home. Here, where she belongs. Why don't you go get her? I, uh, I think that might be difficult under the circumstances. I'm afraid she bears considerable rancor for myself and Mrs. Perling. Perhaps someone like you could, uh, well, persuade her that it would be the best thing to do. I go down to New Orleans and get her? Exactly. I was going anyway. Oh? Why? Well, offhand, you don't seem like the father who's happy to know that his daughter, whom he hasn't seen or heard from in a year, is alive and well. You haven't made a move to go and pick her up yourself. Also, she was found too soon and too fast after I got in on the picture. <laughs> hey, you can stop right there. I'm sure I wouldn't even attempt to explain any of those things. I didn't think you would. Or could. Hmm? I'm on my way to New Orleans, Mr. Perling, to get your daughter. I think she'd be crazy if she came back here, but I'll take it up with her. Do that. I wonder if you'd like to try to explain something else for me. What? Why you were feeding me out a couple of minutes ago to see if I'd buy off. Get out of here. Get out. 
Why not? Expense account item 11, $113.15. Airfare incidentals, New York to New Orleans, Louisiana. The temperature was exactly 28 degrees hotter when I landed. In the cab from the field, I peeled off my coat and loosened my tie and took off my hat. I walked into the lobby of the Roosevelt Hotel that way. Everyone else seemed cool enough in linens and tropicals. Everyone except myself and a big blonde giant of a man leaning against the CNS ticket counter. Boy, take Mr. Dollar to 511. The giant smiled when he saw me and stuck out his hand. Well, 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 I'm certainly glad to see you. We, we thought you'd never get here. Hope you had a pleasant trip. I was okay. I know you're tired and hot and would like to wash up a little and refresh yourself, but the rest of the boys are headquartered in 810. They're mighty anxious to meet you. Mighty anxious. Us Delta cotton growers are going to make it or break it at this convention. Yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. We sure are, are we? Uh, as soon as you're cleaned up, you come right over. We have a drink and I'll show you around the town. Yeah, that'll be swell. 810? 810. Uh, about an hour? About an hour. Uh, I'll see you. Hey, clerk. Yes, sir? How long have the Delta Cotton Growers been in town? Delta Cotton Growers? Well, they had their convention last month, sir. Who's registered in 810? We have no 810, sir. I'd done someone dirty. When he came over with hand out in front, I was supposed to say, you got the wrong fellow, my name's Dollar. But I made him play it out for a particular reason. He wanted to know who I was, and he didn't quite know. But then I wanted to know who he was, and I didn't quite know. I wanted to know him because of that 38 strapped under his left arm. It bulged out just enough to make me curious. By 7.30, I'd eaten dinner and found an address on Ursuline Street, the address where Jeannie Perling was living. The mailbox carried that name. It was one of those unpainted apartment houses in the French Quarter, full of heat and low-watt light bulbs. The girl who opened the door was a medium-sized blonde, and she wore a black dress. The girl I was looking for had cold black hair. Yes? How do you do? My name's Johnny Dollar. I came here to see Jeannie Perling. Come in, please. You're a friend of Jean's? In a way. I just came from New York. You know her father, then? Yes. Oh. I'm Janice Floyd, Jean's roommate. This way. Careful, it's a little dark. Sure. Maybe I had the feeling when I saw the black dress. But I knew I had it when Janice Floyd turned and led me through the two large rooms that made the apartment. I thought that was the end of it, but there was one more room. The blonde girl stood to one side so I could see in. The perspiration began to trickle down my face. I knew what was coming. Here she is, Mr. Dollar. She was there, all right. As lovely and as young and beautiful as the picture. There was a candle burning at her head and feet. And she was dead. I don't know how long I stood there in that dark room staring down at her. I think there were other people in there, too. Dark people, heads bowed. Hands folded in front of them, all looking at her. How did it happen? Leukemia. You know, didn't you know her very long? No. No, as a, as a matter of fact, Miss Floyd, I... I didn't ever know her. I, I certainly didn't know she was dead when I came here tonight. I, I hardly expected... She a... asked that it be this way. But who are you? I'm an insurance investigator. From her father? Not exactly, no. Oh, yes, I see it now. You aren't the first one who's been here looking for her. There have been others, detectives and lawyers trying to get her to go back. What? If he'd loved her, if they'd loved her for just one unselfish moment, she would still be there. Well, Mr. Dollar, she's where her father can't bother her anymore. You tell him that when you go back to New York. Tell him he can stop hiring lawyers and detectives to find her. Now get out. Expense account item 13, $5, the usual charge in any city for having a legal document copied and photostatted. A death certificate verifying the fact that the girl had died on the 20th day of the month. A medical report attached to the certificate named the cause of death as leukemia. I had copies of all these legal documents by 10 o'clock the following morning. I even went through the motions of phoning the desk and asking for a bill and making a plane reservation for that night. I had a feeling someone would be very interested to see me take care of all those things, and I was right. The big blonde man with the 38 happened to be in one corner of the lobby when I paid my bill. 
He also happened to be at the airport when I picked up my ticket, but then he got careless. I walked through the gate, waited two minutes, and slipped back to grab a cab in front, just in time to see him wheel a battered convertible out of the parking lot and head back for town. I followed in my cab. He went to the Ursuline Street address. Two minutes later, he came out. Expense account, item 14, $8. I let my cab go and strolled up to him just as he was getting in his car. Hiya. Uh, what? Look, we've been playing games long enough, don't you think? Well? Why don't you go back to New York and do what you have to do? Deliver this death certificate? I don't believe it. You saw her dead, didn't you? Still don't believe it. That's too bad, because that's the way it is. He got in his car, started it up, drove away. I stood there and watched him go. Money, I kept saying to myself. Money. There's money in it somewhere. Plain old money. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, there's still money in it. More money than it takes to save a life. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Janice Floyd, Mr. Dollar. Hello. I understand you don't quite believe that Jeannie Perling is dead. That's about right. I'm really not concerned one way or the other what you believe or disbelieve. I do know that I've been through quite an ordeal lately. And if you have any plans for interfering or bothering me in any way, I'll call the police. All right. I hope you understand that. I do. Well, then, goodbye. Goodbye. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Eastern Liability and Trust Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Perling matter. I wrote to Morton Scottman at Eastern Liability and I explained the circumstances under which I had arrived in New Orleans and located Jeannie Perling. I enclosed her death certificate and the medical statement. I also reported on the conduct of her ex-roommate, Janice Floyd. Then I sat down and called Janice on the phone. Hello? This is Johnny Dollar, Miss Floyd. Yes. I think it's time we had a talk. Mr. Dollar, we have nothing to discuss. I think we have. What? How you're being taken. Taken? By whom? By a couple of people. Goodbye, Mr. Look, don't hang up on me, Miss Floyd. I came down here to find Jean Perling. I'm with an insurance company. It was my job to check on a story her father told. Finding her was part of it. Let me come over and talk to you. I'll be home tonight. The apartment was six blocks from the hotel. I walked it for a reason. All kinds of people have followed me at one time or another, and I've followed all kinds of people. But the man who followed me off and on in New Orleans, the big blonde man with a 38, knew what he was doing. He was a professional. I made up my mind about that the first time I saw him, and I thought I was ready for him, but I wasn't. He waited until the streetlights got dim and no one was in sight. Oh! I vaguely remember that he caught me under the arms and laid me gently down on the street. That was all. Easy, buddy, easy. You've been making too much whoopee. Oh. You folks visiting down here ought to be more careful. Oh. Get your suit all dirty. I wouldn't have found you, but my cab conked out right here. Oh, my head, the side of my head. Yeah, you must have fallen hard. You had enough for tonight, or you want to keep going? Oh, I've had plenty. Yes, sir. I'll call a doctor. No, no. Help me. I'll be all right. Go up. Easy now. Easy. Thanks. What time is it? Uh, uh, almost midnight. Two hours. Where you want to go? Ursuline Street. Get in. Get in. Expense account item 16, $10, to one good Samaritan cab driver who picked me up and dropped me at Janice Floyd's apartment. I was still weaving on my feet when I tapped on the door. Mr. Dollar, you've been hurt. Come in. I'm all right. Packing? 
Yes, I've decided to leave town. Tonight, as a matter of fact. Yeah, I thought it'd be something like that. Did a big fella, a blonde man, have anything to do with your decision to leave? That's none of your business. Let me tell you my business, Miss Floyd. I came down here to see Jean Perling. You saw her. She is dead. Yes, I saw her. Dead. Yesterday, I mailed a copy of her death certificate to New York. Well, then what else? What other business? The man who came here yesterday and reported to you. The man who told you I'd left town and you could breathe easier again. The same man who called you later and told you I was still around, still asking questions. He's my business. He followed me on my way here tonight. He slugged me. He... I don't believe you're telling me the truth. What's his name? Any idea why he carries a gun? Carries a gun? You're making all this up. Why would I? I've got what I came for, or practically what I came for, legal proof of the whereabouts of one Jean Perling. If Al hit you, he was trying to protect me. Now, listen to me. I think I have pretty much of it in hand now. You tell me if I'm wrong. First off, you're not any Janice Floyd. I'd guess that Janice Floyd was the girl who died of leukemia. I've got her picture in my wallet. It was given to me by David Perling, who said it was his daughter. This is all crazy. Before I you don't... go into that, listen. I can have that body exhumed. I don't want to do it, but I will if I have to. Now, do you want me to do that? All right. I'm Jean Perling. And that was the Floyd girl who died? Yes. She was sick and... Well, I knew my father had detectives looking for me. I just never wanted to see him again or go home again. It seemed if... If poor Janice were dying and she had no one... If she somehow had my name and... Well, I'd never be bothered with my family again. That was a pretty idea. Was it yours? Al and I thought of it. Al? Al Britt. The blonde guy. Okay, how'd he work it? He saw to it that Janice had my name. I know it was against the law, but it... Well, she had no one, and if she was buried with my name, then I'd be free of my family. Well, that took some managing. They hate me. They always have. I want my own life. I don't blame you. You're entitled to it. Are you sure that's what you're getting? I'm going to marry Al, no matter what. If you go back and tell them, well... That'll be that. If you let me stay dead, I... Can't let that happen. Why not? Why not, Mr. Dollar? What harm would it do? Let your father make a fool out of you? I don't understand. You're worth $100,000. What? Cold, hard cash. An irrevocable trust was set up on you when you were born. Comes to you when you're 25. That'll be next month. I don't care about the money. Now, wait a minute. In the event you should die before your 25th birthday, the money would revert to your nearest of kin. My father? Your father. But I'm dead on paper. Uh-huh. Then Al... Al... Somebody paid him, probably your father, to make love to you. Oh, no. No. Get out of here, Dollar. Al, wait. I told you this man meant nothing but trouble. He knows all about oh, it. Oh, he can't prove a thing. Get out of here, you... Take it easy, Bruce. Al, Al. Yes, honey. I know about you, uh... Honey, I, I don't know what to say. Go. Just go, please. He went. He looked at both of us as he went out the door. It was sort of a whip look, the way a puppy stares at you when you've caught him chewing on a slipper. I sat a while with Jean Perling. She didn't say much. There wasn't much she could say. I told her I didn't think there was any reason for her to go back to New York unless she wanted to. She said she didn't want to go, didn't know what to do at the moment, and, well, we left it at that. I went back to my hotel and tried to get some sleep. About 6 o'clock in the morning, I got up, bathed, shaved, and packed. By 7.30, I had breakfast and was just about to check out. Hello? Hello, Britt. Leaving? That's right. I'd like to talk first. Sure. Okay. You messed it up fine for her and me. I tried to call her this morning and she hung up on me. I went over there, she wouldn't let me in. I don't blame her, do you? I guess I don't. I've decided to leave town. Yeah, maybe that's better. I don't know whether it is or not. You make it hard for a guy to talk. All right, now look at it my way. This whole thing's been rotten. I met her father and I know what kind he is. I know what he's done to her, what he'll do to her if she goes back... And then there's you, Britt, the hired man. You went in and made love to her for a salary. I didn't like it having to tell her that, and it must hurt. It must hurt pretty bad. So you see, I'm not too interested in what you might have to say or what you're going to do. Wait. You're right reading me out this way. I deserve it. 
The old man found out where she was four months ago. I found out for him. I knew the girl she was living with had leukemia. I planned the whole switch. I put it to her the way she explained it, about being dead to keep away from her old man. Of course, you didn't mention that 100000 he could get his hands on once she was dead. Oh, I didn't. But, but something funny happened to me, Dollar. I mean... Oh, I've done my share of dirty jobs. I've seen a lot of the human race. Taking a salary to make a sucker out of her didn't bother me at all. Not at first. And then... I found out when she touched my face, I I lived for that touch. And when I held her, she, she lived for me. I never thought it had happened to me, but it did. Yeah, if you see her again, Dollar, tell her I was trying to stop it. I mean, all this part. But it was too late. <laughs> Funny how things turn out, huh? Yeah. Funny. Expense account item 17, $42.13, hotel and board bill. Item 18, $101 even, airplane ticket back to Hartford. Item 19, $1, cab fare. I stopped by her apartment on my way to the airport. Oh, I thought you'd left, Mr. Dollar. Well, came to say goodbye. How's it going today? All right. I have some brandy. No, no thanks. Jean. Yes? You going to New York? No, I'll stay here a while. I don't want to see my father or mother. How about Al Britt? He wants to see you. Let's not talk about him, shall we? Do you think I'm a nice girl? You think my hundred thousand dollars will attract a lot of nice, eligible young men to me? Do you think oh, I... Oh, stop it. You'll burn your brakes. Johnny. Oh, no, here. I know what he did. I know why he did it. But I love him. He did his job too well. Yeah. He could tell you what he started out to do and what happened to him with you. He could tell you if you'd let him. He told you? Yeah. What kind of a trick is it? No trick. Couldn't be. The guy's too mixed up. Tell you what, he'll try again. When he calls up next time, talk to him. Why should I? Because you may not have a mother and father or anyone else, but you do have him. And you will have him as long as he lives, if you want him. And that's what you've been looking for all your life. Someone to have. I'd take him if I were you. Item 20, $10, miscellaneous. Total expense account, $714.35. Remarks, none. Report, she took him. They were married in Tampa this morning. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's intriguing story. Next week... A lonely girl, a fine young man, a gentle father. And one of them is a killer. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Mary Jane Croft, Forrest Lewis, Jeanette Nolan, Russell Thorson, Michael Ann Barrett, Jack Petruzzi... Barbara Fuller, Herbert Ellis, and Marvin Miller. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino and Carl Fortina. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking.